Welcome back to Realism Overhaul. The past few weeks we've been working towards completing either a lunar flyby contract or a lunar impact contract. And well, although our progress is slow, it is happening. But to not get ahead of ourselves, uh, the first thing we need to address today is concerning the previous episode. Uh, if you've seen it, you know the design was basically an egg where we send Kerbals up into space inside of a fairing and then decouple the cockpit from the fairing to land safely. And well, uh, although it was uh, first christened Subasaur or uh, Chicken Wing by Twitch viewers, um, we've actually discovered the creator of the idea um, and they go by Lucy and they suggested the name, uh, the Matryoshka cockpit. So um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I'm apologies if I do. So Subasaur has been renamed Matryoshka 1. And I'm mentioning this not only to give credit where credit's due, but also because this is not the only time Matryoshka 1 has launched. We've actually launched it five more times, um, all the way up into July 1957 is the, the sixth and last launch of Matryoshka 1. So Jebediah, Bill, Bob, and Valentina have all flown in this egg and have all suffered roughly 12 Gs on re-entry. Not great for the crew, which is one of the reasons why we uh, we canceled the program. The main reason we canceled the program, however, is because, well, there are no more contracts. I pretty much milked all the contracts out of it that I could to get as much money as I could. And with the more money we have, we can speed up our build speed and our research speed ever so slightly. So that's pretty much mainly what we've been doing. When we complete contracts, we haven't been building up money. We've been pretty much pouring it into Kerbal construction time to speed things up a little bit. And then somewhere after July 57 uh, to 1958, when our next uh, rocket launches were, the crew actually all retired. I'm pretty sure all four of them retired, so we no longer have any astronauts. So we're going to have to hire some new ones. I didn't realize that they would retire that early because RP1 only gave me a uh, will not retire before this date um, but apparently when they reached that date they did retire so it's kind of interesting the next thing uh, that we wanted to do was just complete one of the contracts that would give us a little more money um, I think it was about 60k money 60k funds um, and it was just a, a solar-powered satellite contract, and we just got our primitive satellite, um, not satellites, solar panels, which aren't really even capable of sustaining um, the Able Core, for instance. I think that's the Able Core. Um, but it was our chance to use some brand new engines and test something uh, brand new in the program. So uh, this was christened GenSat. Uh, because I couldn't think of anything more creative than generic satellite at the time. And this program isn't going to be long-standing, so GenSat seems, seems pretty okay. On the 13th of June, 1958, GenSat-1 attempted its first launch. However, I had neglected to do any ground testing on the 108 engine, the RD-108. And because of this, we had absolutely no data on it. I, it slipped my mind. So, uh, one of the four 108s on the first stage did not light on the launch pad, which caused the rocket to fall back onto the pad and give us a nice explosion, a nice expensive explosion. So, um, unfortunately, the cost of building Gensat was about half of the cost, or not the cost, half of um, what we would receive from completing the contract. So essentially, um, we have to build another GenSat, and it will go up on the 26th of December, 1958. However, we're not really going to gain anything from this contract. We pretty much have to launch up the GenSat 1 in order to even out the GenSat program. So, we're not making much profit, however, we are, um, <laughs> we're, we're breaking even. So, uh, this launch was essential to not start losing funds already. Now these small contracts are stepping stones towards a larger stepping stone of impacting the moon or flying by the moon. And initially, I figured I could quite easily complete the um, lunar flyby 
because uh, the contract stated only within 5,000 kilometers of the moon. So as um, we completed these contracts, we also um, upgraded our launch facility. The tracking center and mission control, I believe, we upgraded to the next level. And that gave us flight planning so we could make a, uh, make a maneuver note and hold it instead of, you know, uh, guessing where to go. And with Principia, if you don't have flight planning, it does not let you put a maneuver on the nav ball. And if you are doing more than one uh, vector, for instance, prograde and normal, um, you would kind of have to guess since we don't really have good engines that have multiple ignitions, we had one shot at the actual maneuver. So flight planning was pretty essential. Essentially, we were going to make this rocket and um, try to hit the moon or fly by the moon. Um, it wasn't until much, much later, hours and hours into this, um, that I discovered there was something else to the lunar flyby contract. And that was that I had to um, collect science uh, flying by the moon and transmit it back or recover it. And that is actually a roadblock for this mission. Um, I'm unable to do that because we don't have any um, any satellite dishes, any antennas that can reach the moon from Earth. So essentially, once we get into low Earth orbit, we plan a maneuver that gets as close to the moon as possible, let it go, hope it works. Um, but we can't control it after that. We can't do any science and it flies past the moon and even farther into space. So even if it was on a free return trajectory, our, our battery would definitely drain before it reached Earth again because our solar panels aren't that great and the avionics unit cannot be shut down, which is the main problem why we can't do that. So that would leave us with the Lunar Impact Contract. And unfortunately, we also have a slight road, roadblock there, which may be able to be fixed in the Ascent Profile. However, it's going to require a completely redesign of the rocket because uh, we need some more Delta V in order to do this. Um, but um, the problem being our inclination relative to the moon. Launching straight east as close to the moon or plane as possible from Florida here, our relative inclination is 9 degrees. And unfortunately, that 9 degrees is enough to make an impact um, not possible with the amount of Delta V I designed in this particular um, engine. At least it wasn't possible at this time of the year. Um, it, it's very possible we could time it just right so that our ascending or descending node relative to the moon um, matches up with the point of our orbit where we need to burn to reach the moon. However, it is a very, very narrow window. And unfortunately, our program just doesn't have the funds to sort of guesstimate this kind of thing because it is very, very possible that the mission will not succeed if I sort of eyeball it and go for it. So what we're gonna have to do instead of actually running this mission is wait, essentially. We're gonna have to do some more small contracts, just various satellite contracts to slowly, slowly gain up funds because we need a good amount of money to sort of be a buffer so we don't throw all of the money the program has into this one mission like I have done previously and just hope it works. But the past few weeks, I've been pretty much coming to this realization and that involved many, many hours of writing scripts um, in KOS to make this rocket reach orbit. I believe I've mentioned this last episode, but this is concerning avionics and the way I, and the reason why, sorry, I write KOS scripts for the Ascent. One, it means I can get some pretty cool shots of the rockets while, uh, while they launch, because I'm not controlling it manually. Uh, two, it's actually saving me a bit of performance, um, rocket-wise. Um, it saves me a little bit of Delta V, because, say you have a 20-ton rocket, 
and you have avionics up to two tons. Like the payload is two tons, so you can control that. Um, and the stage to get it up there is eight tons. These are arbitrary numbers. I don't think that kind of rocket work. If you had another avionics unit that added eight tons, you'd be able to control the rocket. However, if you have the ADI if you have the avionics at two tons and write a KOS script to burn through the first stage and ascent profile you'd like, you don't need to have excess avionics uh, when it's running on the script. However, this is only useful in unmanned spacecraft because the manned spacecraft don't require these avionics units at all, I don't believe, unless RP-1 changed that. I haven't done a whole lot with crewed missions yet in RP-1. And last but not least, I wanted to talk about the future of the series. Um, the way things are currently looking, um, Realism Overhaul being updated to 161, um, Principia um, no longer being updated for 131. Um, it's looking like our series is going to upgrade to 161 relatively soon. As soon as um, Realistic Progression is officially updated to 161, there's like a, a work in progress way of doing it but I'm not sure how stable it is, and I'd rather you know keep a stable install than to just skip ahead to 161 as soon as possible. But once RP1 has a stable release for 161, we're gonna be switching to that. And I don't believe I'm going to just uh, start a new save on 161 and cheat all the, the science nodes and our money and time up to our current spot. What I think we're gonna do is actually completely restart. However, the YouTube series is not going to restart. Um, what I'm gonna do is broadcast on Twitch the 161 series up to our current point in the YouTube series and then have the next episode there. So from the last 131 episode to the first 161 episode, there isn't gonna be any um, restarting there. It'll just fluidly progress to the next episode. We will just be in a brand new um, version of the game. So essentially I'm going to be recreating everything I do here, which is kind of disheartening, um, but it, 161 is going to be worth it. The performance gain with that is essential. Um, and I'm pretty sure a lot of the mods that I have in 131 will work in 161, but that's a problem for future me. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So progress will continue. We are slowly working our way towards a lunar impactor mission since, or flyby. If we, if we can get some nodes, some science nodes of earth to moon rated uh, communications, a flyby is definitely gonna be in the books. However, an impact is kind of easier if we can get it right because we don't need to communicate with a thing. We just have to slingshot it to the moon and let it hit the thing. So, that is all I have for you today. I want to thank you guys so much for sticking around, so much for watching, and peace out.